This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 600. Woohoo! 600 times, Cliff. And we welcome Jonathan Hale. We're going to talk about the new ACGIH white paper, Ventilation for Industrial Settings During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And as I mentioned in the, sh- in the show announcement, even if you don't work in industrial settings, you're going to learn a lot with today's show. Before we get started, we have to thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio is still free. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at cirscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at iaqa.org. AIHA, healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at particlesplus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. The IAQ Radio Trivia Question for today September 25, 2020, has been sponsored by Ideas, a solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's IQ Radio trivia question. Name the term used to refer to the particle size at which an air filter has its lowest air arrestance. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Today's guest is Jonathan Hale. He is the chair of the Ventilation for Industrial Settings during the COVID-19. Well, he's the chair of the committee that wrote that white paper. He's also the chair of the Ventilation, Industrial Ventilation Committee. He has a varied background. He was an EPA inspector and permits engineer. Uh, He was also the uh, director of environmental engineering and industrial hygiene for the Douglas Battery Manufacturing and the founder of Air Systems Corporation, Inc. in 2009. And he was a, he's been doing uh, consulting since then. Uh, John, do we have you on the line? Yes. uh, Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome to IAQ Radio. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hey, John, can you? Tell us a little bit about your background and and how you got into this industrial ventilation as deeply as you have. Well, sure. Um, uh, I graduated from college and was looking for something to do. I taught uh, high school biology, biology, chemistry, and physics for a while and uh, went to work for the EPA and ended up a permits engineer and uh, did a lot of testing of of air air quality in a lot of uh, commercial and industrial settings. Uh, and after doing that, um, I went to work for Douglas Battery. I got on the right side of the law and uh, started working for uh, Douglas Battery Manufacturing and had uh, 500 people or so that, uh, that I was responsible for their health and well-being and did all the industrial hygiene uh, services and, and uh, air pollution and dust collection for those. Uh, after doing that for about five years, uh, I, I decided I wanted to get, get uh, out and uh, do some design. I, had, uh, I became uh, one of the instructors at the North Carolina Industrial Ventilation Conference, which is in its 67th year. And um, I got pulled onto the Industrial Ventilation Committee after doing that for about 10 years. Uh, and I've, I'm one of the co-chairs of that. Uh, so anybody wants to learn about industrial ventilation design, 
uh, come to either the one of the industrial ventilation conferences where we it's a week long graduate level course teaching people how to design heavy industrial air pollution control systems, dust collectors and the like, for those of your listeners that are, have a little dust systems and that kind of thing. Uh, that's it through the University of North Carolina. There's another one at the University of uh, at Michigan State University, but it's uh, the Michigan Industrial Ventilation Conference, which is, I think, in its 70th year coming up, wow. and one on the West Coast. Um, and these people are uh, part and parcel, a lot of the industrial hygienists and designers that uh, end up being uh, the members of the industrial ventilation committee that I've been serving on for the last 15 years. And that industrial ventilation committee, John, can you put up the, the cover of the book for us there? John Faith. There we go. Industrial ventilation, a manual of recommended practice for design, the 30th edition. This has been around. This is kind of the Bible in industrial ventilation here, John. And I remember our, our technical director, Dr. Dietrich Weil, who, who did a lot of work in mines and uh, a lot of industrial, you know, steel mills, et cetera, here in the Pittsburgh area. He used to talk about this book all the time and how important it was to him. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about what's in this book? Sure. We have uh, chapters on their industrial hygiene just as one chapter kind of to get people situated. And then we tell uh, how to interface uh, the person to a some sort of an engineering control, typically a dust collector or an air pollution control system that will remove the exposure issue you can, using local exhaust ventilation, extracting it to some sort of device which renders it harmless and sends it to atmosphere or recirculates it back into the, into the plant. There's also chapters on uh, special things. Uh, one of the part, things would be dilution ventilation, uh, we uh, do not have something in there. We, COVID is not mentioned in there, as, but it will be in the next one. And uh, we have a chapter on, uh, on in industrial ventilation in a dilution ventilation sense uh, that would be very, maybe very useful to those people thinking about COVID because the principles of air, uh, which is in chapter three of the ventilation manual, are the same for any HVAC engineer or ventilation engineer. Uh, we, uh, my quick story is uh, we did a conference in the uh, Malaysian Industrial Hygiene Association, and we said, uh, we went out to Malaysia, and we said, well, you'll need books. You'll need to have a ventilation manual for us to teach the course. And uh, we, said, we, we said, how many do you need? And they said, we don't need any. And we thought, well, that's crazy. Uh, so we flew out to, to Malaysia, and everybody had their own. They had their own uh, manual, and they were blue ones and yellow ones and brown ones. And these people were, they were mouse-eared and tabbed to, so that they could use them, and they had all been using them all their lives. So we have a, a worldwide uh, following with this manual. Uh, it's even uh, published in once in Spanish. So it truly is one of those worldwide ACGIH uh, devices to tell people how to design and is really the only proper means of uh, accept or the most accepted means of designing air pollution and dust collection systems around the world. You know, it's, and the, and the fundamentals, as you said, are, are applicable to any environment, not just industrial. I mean, it, it would work in, in commercial buildings, even, even residential. I've been thinking about my own home and, and some of the ventilation issues in my own home. And um, these, these principles would work anywhere. Let's, let's also quickly, who is asking ACGIH to put together something more specific to COVID-19 than the, the industrial and ventilation manual? Well, put yourself in the position of the plant engineer or the environmental health and safety uh, officer who's saying, uh, you know, I, I really need to protect my employees. What do I do? Do I, I know I really don't want to move air around a lot, but I've got people that are hot. Do I make them turn off the personnel fans, the big pedestal cooling fans, which is, you know, the, a lot of plants, down, especially down south, are, are not air conditioned and, and up north. 
so, you know, how do we, do we tell them not to turn off when it gets hot outside, not to turn off the fans? Or how about we got a lot of calls from uh, people asking about paint spray booths. Do we turn them off? Do we turn off our air pollution control devices, our dust collector systems? Do we not allow for recirculation of the dust collector systems? One of the things is, is that industrial ventilation engineers uh, are hated by HVAC engineers. And we, we, don't, we don't get along. It's, it's, we, actually, we actually love them. But every HVA, the purpose of HVAC engineering is to make uniform in, in a room. What we want is we want the temperature the same in one corner of the room as it is in the other. So we do that using turbulent air uh, and the design with high velocity vectors or, or grills that throw the air out and project the air out to cause circulation and dilution and, and so that you get uniformity. Well, if you've got a COVID virus, uniformity and spreading it around is the antithesis of what you want. Excellent. So we have very specific recommendations uh, in there that are, we feel like, in the, and we, we felt like we had to put out this paper uh, in, in a very quick fashion to try to help people and give them an idea as to what kinds of uh, positive uh, forces they could do and changes that they could make in their industrial setting uh, and commercial settings for that matter. Uh, and industrial settings also go to operating room. An operating room is, is really an industrial setting. Uh -huh. Or a, uh, if you think about it that way, or how about a rifle range? A rifle range is a place where you, you're putting out a lot of lead and a lot of other toxic materials, and you're projecting them into, into a room, and you want to protect everybody uh, from this concentrated toxin. And so what we do is we set up the air. Uh, we, have a, we have in the chapter 13 of the ventilation manual, we have, we have 155 different schematics on how to protect workers using air. And it's everything from kitchen to paint spray booths to a rifle range or, and to an operating room or a mortuary table. Uh, or as well as how to make steel or, or any, anything else. So with that being said, they, in a rifle range, we take all the air and we put it behind the, the people that are shooting and we take the exhaust all out from behind where the, it's being shot. And these, these same principles would be used in, for some of your clients, I know, for asbestos removal. Yeah. Uh, you want to contain the contaminant you want to take exhaust away from the contaminant that pulls it away from the face of the employee. And you want to do that in a uniform fashion without a lot of turbulence. And so those, okay. those basic principles are found throughout the industrial ventilation manual and are uh, useful in a very practical sense. Um, I am not a practicing industrial hygienist anymore. Uh, I haven't done it for 30 years. What I do, uh, what I did last year until I retired, was fix broken air pollution control systems and help people uh, by consulting to them to reduce their risk of exposure in employees. And it's all about reducing risk. Okay, John, we're going to go into um, some of the, the details and diagrams in the document and further explain what you just went through as a summary here. Uh, before we do though, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the the first thing in the, one of the first things I noticed is that you, that you had the hierarchy of controls and, and John Faith, if you could pull that up for us, um, industrial hygienists and others are always talking about the hierarchy of controls. And I thought it'd be good to start with that and maybe go over the hierarchy of controls uh, with listeners and give a couple examples. And then we'll move on and talk a little bit more about, you know, the air movement within these rooms, turbulent air movement, et cetera. Sure. And what, what we're doing is at every station uh, here, we're going we're gonna to move from the elimination all the way to PPE. And with, with each furthering station that we go to, we are further reducing the risk. Um, and so uh, if, we are, if we have a COVID, if we have somebody that's COVID in our home, uh, we, would, we, we, can, you, we can eliminate that we can take them and we can put them someplace else. 
That's an example of elimination. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, and that's also true of really any of uh, uh, any toxic material. There are a lot of things that have happened. For another example would be, we used to use flammable solvents. Well, flammable solvents are a real problem. So what we, what we use in the workplace oftentimes are non-flammable solvents. And all you have to do to make a flammable solvent not very flammable is add chlorine to it or uh, some sort of a halogen to it. Well, there's some problems with that. Uh, our body uh, with halogenated hydrocarbons, uh, that sounds like a pesticide to me. So um, those are the kind of things we, we some, if we can eliminate or we can substitute, uh, whether it's fire or if we have a chlorinated solvent, we may substitute it with a non-chlorinated solvent that is also not very flammable. So those are the best ways, and we like that. This comes from uh, the basic. This is the basics of industrial hygiene, hygiene, and it's used. It's found in a white book, and it's really you know, it was provided uh, in the beginnings of industrial hygiene. And at the source of every industrial hygiene is how they approach things. So with the COVID, if we if we place that the COVID in that context, certainly it has a lot of uh, can have a lot of meaning, uh, and we can do that with at each point. The next section in yellow is engineering controls. Engineering controls is what the industrial ventilation manual is about. It's how to design systems that can uh, re reduce, remove, or mitigate uh, the hazard itself using some sort of an engineering concept. And that can be a lot of different things. That can be air going into a dust collector system. It can be putting a fan in your, in your window while you're painting. And then the question becomes, do you want to exhaust that fan or do you want to push in? Well, it, 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 it depends and the engineering controls and that would also apply to COVID. Then last is administrative controls. Engineering controls don't work very well without uh, certain industrial uh, administrative controls. Think of it as so work practices are an example of an administrative control. It's how you handle the product it's how you handle the patient. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the last uh, we, we use is, is uh, personal protective equipment. And PPEs can be anywhere from a mask that uh, doesn't protect the transmitter, but, it's, but it reduces the, uh, the airborne particulate exposure to people that are at six feet away from those projected particles that from sneezing or coughing. It doesn't do very much on the breathing out of the particles that are, are extremely small, um, it, although it does do something there. And it doesn't protect the person that's wearing the mask as well as we would like. If you're going to be doing intubation of a COVID patient, that PPE is going to be, as a matter of fact, we don't even like to talk about masks, industrial hygienists, that is, don't like to talk about masks as personal protective equipment. Uh, we would like to think of that as respirators or completely uh, even as a self-contained breathing apparatus in the cases of somebody who is in a very high risk area or at least a powered air purifying respirator or something of that sort. So those are the hierarchy of controls and they can be applied to, to really uh, any application of exposure of some sort of contaminant or toxic material. John, let's let's talk a little bit about ventilation and, and the the I guess the fundamental types of ventilation. You've talked a good bit about ventilation and, and, and I just want to make sure we've got our terminology. How do you describe the different fundamental types of ventilation in a building? Uh, well there again that there's that thing with the HVAC engineers who want to blow stuff around and industrial hygienists uh, would, would, and industrial ventilation engineers, uh, who are oftentimes industrial hygienists, would, would want to segregate the contaminated air uh, uh, from the air that has, has got the COVID in it. So what we try to do is try to use the natural tendencies of air to, uh, to provide us with better protection. For example, uh, we talk, we talk about risk, and I'd, I would like to talk about risk a little further. Uh, the possibilities of COVID are, I'm not wearing a mask right now, and neither are you, but you're in a, in a semi-protected 
area. Are you at risk? Well, certainly you are. And, and there could be a COVID uh, vector traveling and, and a piece of RNA traveling around for lots of different reasons. And they can be transported for long, long periods and distances. So, uh, but we, re we, we take care of risks every day. There are risks, uh, if, if you're gonna go to the store, you're gonna have a risk of getting in the car. You could get killed in the car. And if you walk, it's a different risk. If you fly an airplane, it's a different risk. And going in, are you gonna wear a mask or not? Well, that depends. And it really, are you going to, uh, are you gonna get on an elevator if you uh, wanna go into a building? What's the risk with going uh, into uh, an elevator? Well, an elevator is a very small area. If there's no one in there, then you're probably pretty safe. If, uh, if you wanted to make it safer, you'd make the elevator bigger and still not have anybody in there. But it turns out that some of the testing done by EPA and a professor out of Texas, he, he will cite that the elevators are maybe some of the safest places uh, for COVID exposure that, that you can, can get because the air turnover rates are so high. Uh, elevators are designed with a, an exhaust fan and they bring the air in at the opposite end of the elevator so that, so that you get um, immediate turnover and very little mixing. Now, if you get a couple of people on there with COVID that are, are, are joining you in the elevator, your risk is going to jump, even with the air turnover rate every minute or so. But also, we from the, think of it in, in the same sense as uh, what we would do in the, the rifle range or even in a paint spray booth. What do you feel like the chances are of catching COVID in a paint spray booth would be? Well, it turns out very unlikely, unless somebody is standing up upstream of you sneezing. Right. Now all of a sudden it, it, things change. So, but oftentimes people are wearing respirators, PPEs in, in, inside those things. So uh, some places would surprise you with a turnover, air turnover rate in a paint spray booth, it's typically every minute or even a half a minute. So we get very good turnover rates. And then those, so there's the chances of, and the risk again that you're taking is very low. So, but now how about an, a meat packing plant where you're standing side by side with uh, a number of other friends who one of which may have, have a risk. Well, how do you reduce that risk? Well, you take the kind of things of, of that the CDC has told us and some of the bullet points found in our, in our white paper from ACGIH uh, of you know, wearing gloves and taking temperatures when people come in. And if you feel you know, instructing them and using some administrative controls to, to make sure that training is a part of that, uh, that, that uh, those are all things to minimize risk. So we play this game of, of minimizing risk at every, every point. Uh, so getting back to overall in industrial ventilation and how that affects, we want to have greater turnover rates in our plants in this, in, when we can. We have to keep in mind that in the wintertime, that's going to be pretty expensive. But certainly an, a paint spray booth is exhausting 10, 20, 30,000 CFM of air. That air, I have this equation that I teach my students in industrial ventilation called, it's called Gazintas equals Gazautas. It's one of the most important equations you can have or what comes into a, a facility is gonna be the same thing that goes out because otherwise, if you suck hard enough, you will pull the walls in. Air will come in someplace. Uh, when air comes in under in through doorways and under under seams and, and doors, we can get high, very high velocity currents that cause a lot of turbulence. So we want to turn. We want to have very high turnover rates. And this is also true if if you're painting your your some of your clients that are listening today that do internal painting inside a house. You want to you want to open up those windows and you want to get that air turnover. Rate, and you want to put a fan in a window and you want to get your background levels, but you need to think about it to put your, the employee or the person that's being exposed in between the clean air and the exhaust point. 
When you do that, what you get is we get a one-to-one -one mixing. And one-to-one -one mixing is a very important thing because if you, if you blow this stuff around, we, get, we start to get exposure. And that's one of those problems that's something when you get it's what is that exposure level? And we'll talk about that later maybe. But here, for example, this is a, this is a kind of, this is called displacement ventilation. And this is kind of how we would also like to do it in a, in a home if you were sandblasting or painting or something. You'd like to bring the air in from the side low and slow. That's the secret, low and slow. Low and bring slow. Bring our air in, low and slow. Because what's happening in a human being, when we uh, are, we are uh, a mobile source of contaminants, in the case of COVID, we walk around, but we are, when we breathe out, we breathe out uh, a air that is 98.6, hopefully. If it's 101 point something, then maybe we have COVID and we're in really in trouble. <laughs> but that, all of a sudden, that air is pretty hot. And it's buoyant. And it's also, it will be 100% saturated with water. The water holding capacity of that air is, is 100%. So that, we know that because in the wintertime, what we can do is we can see our breath, we can see the condensation, we can see, see the, that happening. So we know that our breath is 100% saturated. That makes that air, water is lighter than air. The molecular weight of water is 18. The molecular weight of air is about 28.96. Uh, gra grams per gram mole. So that said, we are, our molecular weights are different and that causes the air to be very buoyant. So what we do is, I this is this uh, something I'm, I, I, can, I call because I like alliteration, the human fume plume or the thermal plume. It's when we breathe out, we have this thermal plume that causes the air to naturally be buoyant and go up in the air. If we can bring the air in, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, it's just, this I I really like the way this describes displacement ventilation. You know, low and slow, and then bringing it up and out. Um, and then, John, if you could go to the next diagram, I just want to visualize yeah. for listeners and, and, and for viewers well, the this, the um, the standard way of doing air. Yeah, conditioning. and then we can go back to that. To that other drawing. In this case, standard is on the left. That's mixing ventilation, and we use high velocity vectors, uh, like that you see in the in on the left hand side up at the top. Those are those vectors are, are or grills are wanting are doing everything possible to project that air around the room and cause uniformity. So our, our little COVIDs are little blue guys flying around in there, and those uh, those become uniform. Well, uniformity means you can't get away from the, the toxin, or in this case, the COVID virus. Uh, whereas if we can use displacement ventilation, bring it in low and slow, allowing this plume of thermal plume to, to rise up and to cause, allow stratification to happen. Stratification is a normal thing that we all know about. It gets hotter in the, in the top of the room than it does in the lower part. That's where we want that COVID contaminant to go and be exhausted. And in many industrial ventilation uh, situations or many factories, uh, we have uh, thermal exhaust fans in the ceiling, in the roof, as it were, that extract that and keep people from becoming exposed uh, to the COVID over and over again. So while mixing and let's, I, I poo-poo mixing, sometimes the, the only thing you can do is because you don't certainly don't want to build up in a certain area where employees are. So sometimes blowing air at the employees uh, can, can certainly reduce contaminant levels. But if that, if that fan is blowing across a COVID exposed person, exposure person, uh, and uh, maybe they're asymptomatic, and, and, but it, if you blow that plume towards somebody else, we know that uh, from some of the testing that was done, and especially the restaurant in China, uh, that, that having a current, an air current from an HVAC system 
can cause a spread of this plume laterally or horizontally and expose others that are sideways to the, uh, the, the projection of the air current. I, you know, I'd really love this diagram, this detail in here, because it, it shows on the same page the way we're, most people in most commercial buildings, on the left, that's what you see, uh, that mixing ventilation, which if you have good outdoor air, uh, and you and you're you're changing that outdoor air on a regular basis. It, it may help, you know. It will help to some degree, but uh, the the displacement ventilation would seem to work better for this particular situation. So I think that's important. Um, the other thing, why don't we break here, John, and take our halftime break, and we'll be right back with John Hale for the second half in just a minute. John, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Sounds good. High AQ Radio Industry sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org. The American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA. Healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. That's C-I-R-I Science.org. A-C-G-I-H, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at A-C-G-I-H.org. Okay, we're back to the second half of our interview. We've got John Hale. We're talking about this new document, the ventilation for industrial settings during the COVID-19 pandemic. John, um, I'd like to start the second half with the diagram or figure five from the document. And this is on filtration. I wonder if you could go through this figure with listeners and, and um, talk a little bit about filtration as one of these uh, engineering controls that we use to help keep people safe. Yeah, I don't want to give away the answer to the trivia question, golly. Uh, no, that's that's good. Um, the well, I, I let's see. I'm trying to think of where where to start with this. Uh, Dr. Gritzmacher yesterday did a did a wonderful piece uh, that's at ACGIH that you can uh, listen to again that relates the, the, this the, this paper specifically. Uh, and what what we we're trying to say there is it's important to, that people know about filtration uh, of, of the COVID virus. Uh, COVID viruses come in really two different flavors, uh, if I can use the, uh, an incorrect term. They come in, uh, the, the first flavor is the one in the darker blue, and those are particles that are larger than one micron in size, as you can see in the lower, on the, uh, the, the, the lower part of the graph, that's larger than one, part, one micron in size. Remember that a human hair is 60 to 100 microns in diameter. So we're, we're talking about uh, these are large particles and they are expelled during coughing or sneezing. But they're quite aerodynamic and they're, they're heavy because they're, 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 they have a, a lot of water and protein it, it mixed in with them. And they project, but they all, they, uh, the research shows that they are hitting the ground at, at two meters or less uh, in the, for mostly. Then there is that the other particles that are expelled during breathing uh, and, and maybe just talking. Uh, and those are particles that come out 
uh, oftentimes uh, very, very small in between 0.1 and, point and 1 micron, and they actually even get smaller. Uh, and so they, the settling velocity of particles in that range is uh, the same as cigarette smoke. So they're going to be they're going to be buoyant, and they will be in the in the same range, and they will that will loft and carry over. Look what happens to the efficiency here. When we get to the left, they, these are efficiency curves for MERV filters. So MERV six uh, filter is kind of what we used to use. That was a blue kind of uh, very low efficiency filter, and look at the efficiency drops, and but it comes back up. Uh, MERV, the MERV 11 uh, is a higher efficiency filter. A lot of people are using MERV 8 filters these days, and it would, the curve would be somewhere in there in the, in the middle between MERV 6 and 8, and that's the lower and the, the middle dotted lines. Now, look, it's, you see very high efficiency up at 10 microns. That's, you know, in fact, that's going to be pollen and, and things in that range, and it starts to get very low. But look what happens in the nanoparticles all the way to the left. The particulate efficiency goes way up. And this is due to van der Waals forces and forces of electrostatic attraction and diffusion because these particles are being bumped around by air molecules that are being traveled, that are traveling at in excess of, of many, many hundreds of miles an hour. And I'm not talking at scale, I'm talking they're traveling at somewhere between 600 and 1,000 miles an hour. These particles of air that are moving back and forth and causing buffeting these particles around. So they, they, take a, they don't take a straight path through the filter. They actually take a, a path of, of going side to side as they get buffeted about by nitrogen and oxygen uh, molecules. That causes them, and of course, part, the smaller the particle, the, the more they are, are, are attracted because of van der Waals forces. So they have a tendency to stick uh, to filters better at lower lower particle sizes. So what we end up with is a curve of efficiency that is very high at nanoparticulate and very high at large particulate. And somewhere in between is the particle that has the greatest potential for penetration of a for a particle, and that uh, and that is a 0.3 micron size particles. And many of your listeners know the efficiency of a HEPA filter. They are tested and guaranteed individually at 99.97% at three-tenths of a micron. Why three-tenths of a micron? Now you know, because it's the most penetrating particle. We did so have a these, correct answer, so we, we didn't give it away, John. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, we don't want to, we don't, knowledge is power, and we don't want anybody more powerful than us. Isn't that right, Joe? That's right. <laughs> well, let me, I, I've got a text question here I'd like to go over with you. Um, this is from Ed Light. They're looking at spaces where design provides good mixing or displacement, but portable fans or supplemental conditioners allow virus to concentrate and blow directly between occupants. Any advice on assessing and resolving this? They've recommended stop the use of personal fans purifies purifiers and either stop or adjust use, leave buffer zone or send occupancy elsewhere for supplemental conditioning. Any, any thoughts on that, John? Uh, one more time. Where did that come from? That's from Ed Light. Okay. Okay. Well, there, and that is, it's, it's a kind of a damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah. Um, I, I particularly, you know, HEPA fil filters are very good. And these little portable HEPA, HEPA units, well, that's great. Uh, they are going to continue, they will clean the at you and projecting the, uh, what your, the virus that you might be expelling is, is also a factor that needs to be considered. So I like particularly filters, whether they're HEPA filters, which of course do get our three tenths of a micron, uh, and the, uh, and or a some sort of a UVGI filter, uh, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, which oftentimes has high efficiency filter filtration on it as well. I like to see them oriented to where they're pulling in air at the top and projecting the air down low at a low velocity. 
So yeah. I like to see them in, in that kind of a fashion where they're not causing, they're not stirring up the air and stirring up viruses uh, or projecting viruses from one person to another. But certainly fil filtration in your home, uh, you know, here's, here's something, um, which is more efficient, a HEPA filter or, a, or the filter that you have in your home right now, Joe? I would think a HEPA filter. Uh, certainly that makes sense, and that's true initially. But I'm going to make the argument that when that filter in your home, if you let it go for, for a couple of years, it's going to have efficiencies that are closing in on that of a HEPA. As you build up crud, and pri primarily you end up with a lot of hair, that's one of the particulate that we particularly get in homes, cat hair, dog hair, and that kind of thing. We're continuing to make mat in, the, in that, that fibrous filter. And with a, with a higher pressure drop, we start to get higher efficiency. So um, people have this, this incorrect thought that changing their filter more often gives them better air quality. That's not true. The, the efficiency of a filter is best on the last day uh, before, you, before you change it. So, the, I'm sorry, the caveat go ahead. being as long as that loading doesn't cause bypass. Oh, and there you go. That's a, a HEPA. You can't really have a bypass. They'll take 10 inches. Uh, I've seen HEPAs that were constructed to, to take 20 and 30 and 40 inches of water column pressure drop. Uh, and they have seals, uh, sometimes gel and uh, uh, closed cell foam. The, the, but the ones at home, in homes, are cardboard. And once what happens is once you take them to more than three times their initial resistance, or if you don't follow the prescribed uh, requirements of the, the, the filter manufacturer, what can happen is they will buckle and you will get bypass around them. And you get bypass anyway. So sure. what, we, what we don't like to see is uh, it's typically for most throwaway filters, we don't want to see it go more than three times its initial pr pressure drop. And so I would say that something that you could that anyone can do in their factory and or their home is put a manometer in, in measuring inches of water gauge uh, and look at the initial resistance and allow it to go to three times its its uh, its initial resistance before changing so don't prematurely change is another would be a, a recommendation even. well I'm, I'm looking to at the uh, discussion and i've got uh for filtration based on our assessments and interpretation of the science, we're recommending finding the gaps to eliminate bypass, a frequent problem, good stuff, and don't need to allocate tight budgets to hire MERV, uh, expensive with no evidence that reduces COVID transmission. Okay. Um, and I think the one I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm kind of agreeing, is, is over, are we overselling the usefulness and necessity of improved ventilation as a method to lower actual transmission? It's, it's hard to know. That is, uh, until we have, I think one of, the, one of the ways that we could figure that out is through the use of computational fluid dynamics. This is a new tool that we're uh, on the Industrial Ventilation Committee that we're really proud of, uh, and using computers to, to uh, project that. Uh, and it allows the computer to tell you what is actually happening. Okay. So the use I, in the future, we'll start to see computational fluid dynamics and diagrams. We've used a lot of those now in the industrial ventilation manual uh, as the pictures that are in there. We used to have what we called trained lines showing air going back and forth and here and there. Uh, and now we really know where the air it does go use it through the use of the computational fluid dynamics. So okay. I would say that that's a, an important way to go in the future. Uh, I'd like to point to the fact that this document also has a, a real nice section on the different levels of controls and recommendations. So under administrative controls, the things I think most of us have heard, you know, make sure you inform employees about the hazards and symptoms, provide a station to screen employees entering the building, provide training, develop enhanced cleaning and sanitation, stay six feet apart, supply additional hand washing stations, cover their coughs and sneezes. So this is from a meatpacking, I believe, um, plant. 
and they show the difference between bad, you know, setup and then a good setup, uh, maybe a little bit better setup with the partitions and the distancing. And then um, physical barriers such as platforms separate the workers, including where they need to perform tasks in tandem from uh, across each other. So they do a nice job there of, of detailing the, the way people should be set up. How often do you see displacement ventilation in buildings, John? I don't, it's, I don't see it very often. I guess in industrial you know, sites, you may see it more often. Yeah, and, and that's one of, the, one of the problems, is what, what we would recommend is that people not bring in high velocity air uh, to blow things around because it really causes currents. And they, that's the only way to go displacement ventilation. So displacement ventilation is something really to be done in the future. But, yeah. but in keeping those concepts alive, those are uh, using displacement ventilation is, is a proper way in the future to reduce exposures in almost any setting. Gotcha. Okay. It may not be very practical, but it, it's certainly the proper way to do it. And is it more popular in other parts of the world that you know of? Or? Uh, no, it's, it's something that, that really everybody is starting to look at right now. There are places, of course, that we, that we do use displacement ventilation. Uh, uh, like, like I said, uh, paint spray booths and uh, ranges, uh, it is the same. Displacement ventilation is often used in, uh, in painting cars and in uh, operating room theaters. So it's, it's not something that we don't know. It's just a specialized application of ventilation. Gotcha. Okay. And then do you want to go to the, uh, the last set of recommendations there? Yeah, let's do that. Well, we certainly would. These are the, these bullet points are the ones that we really wanted to highlight to everybody. They're, they're kind of simple and practical and pragmatic. And, you know, and this is true in almost any setting, uh, whether it's a, uh, a manufacturing facility or not, but certainly we want to increase our outdoor air supply to 100%. Uh, we, you'd like to take, you want, do we filter outside air? Well, uh, outside air should be clean. Uh, we certainly are, we don't want bugs coming in. So we would like to have a, at least a minimum of efficiency uh, to keep out bugs. But any sort of recirculating system uh, using a dust collector system, the efficiency is relatively close to HEPA efficiency anyway. So keep your, your uh, dust collector systems on, keep your paint spray booths on, uh, and those are, are, you know, and make sure that the ventilation system is performing as designed and per ASHRAE 62.1, which is the law in most places, and make sure that you're, that you're going back and testing to make sure your, your HVAC supply air systems are working properly. Uh, we'd like to see maintain between 6 and 12 air changes per hour. Uh, and uh, this will provide you uh, uh, a 99% purge in 30 to 60 minutes. This is based on, on stuff that came out of the CDC. Okay. Uh, you know, increase your filter efficiencies to MERV 13. ASHRAE came out with some really beautiful stuff uh, that, that showed us how efficient uh, the MERV 13 and 14 filters are especially the electret type filters. Uh, and they do get a uh, very high efficiency. They're, they're, they may only be getting 90% uh, of COVID, but a, a, again, this is all about reducing risk, not sure. mitigating risk. We can't mitigate the risk of COVID. Um, so that's another, another really great ad advice. Uh, provided a, a, Additional dilution ventilation to dispense small airborne particles. It should be introduced in the facility at low and slow. Low and slow. Uh, I like that. Low and slow. <laughs> yeah. Allow the ventilation system to operate continually if the building is, is occupied for long, long enough to allow for several complete air changes following the departure of everybody uh, from that building. If, if, if the system is shut down, or set back at over overnight, return to full operating conditions prior to those occupants return. We want to clear it out as much as possible. Most of these efficiency uh, and air change per hour are based on this, the purge 
uh, equation found that in all industrial hygiene uh, data. But so we, anything we can do to reduce the number of, of people in that area is, is better. Uh, keep, uh, make sure that your, your restroom fans operate continuously. Uh, and as I would say temporarily disable uh, the use of hand dryers. Uh, this is, I, I don't think this is, I think next year we're going to have some sort of reason to want to put these air hand dryers back on. Really? Which is good, good for the environment. But I think in the, in the meantime, we certainly don't want to be, because they are, again, high velocity jets that are blowing, blowing material uh, and could be blowing COVID around. So, uh, so allow that you have in the, with the bathroom fans, leave them on, but um, caveat, make sure they are directly uh, exhausted to the outdoors. Uh, that's very good because many of them aren't. So that, so they're not doing you any good otherwise. I think a lot of times uh, people assume they are, and, and, and unless you check it, you may be surprised how often they're not. Well, that's that, the point of ASHRAE 62.1. Uh, uh, it, it says that you go back and you actually qualify. This is a great time for facility managers and commercial uh, facilities to go back and check their, their HVAC systems and make sure that they are operating properly. Very important. Um, allow our, next one is allow our local exhaust ventilation systems to operate continuously uh, w when people are there. Uh, if you have variable air volume laboratory hoods, you can leave the hood sash in the up position to uh, ask the maximum amount of airflow to happen and exhausted when even when it's not in use. That again, it, more air changes per hour. Uh, the the general airflow direction should be from the cleaner air to the lesser air. Put what you want is uh, the you want to put I so I say seats S E C E put in supply air in a non turbulent fashion. You put the supply air clean on the employee that direct directed at the employee. Then you have the contaminant generation, then you have the exhaust. Unfortunately, our contaminator in this case is a human being. So we, we just wanna put the human being between the source of clean air and the, and the exit for the air. And so we like that upward flow without a doubt for the air to come up and, and stratify and go out. But remember, always remember that uh, this is something that your your readers were, and listeners will enjoy. You can blow 30 to 40 times farther than you can suck. And if you don't believe that, try to suck out your birthday candles on your next birthday. <laughs> uh, you'll find that you can you you can blow a match out at arm's length, but you'll burn your lips uh, if you if you uh, try to suck it out. You you won't be able to affect it. So uh, that's that's what we, and remember that it, it's 30 to 40 times the diameter of the fan. So the pedestal fans that are three, at three feet in diameter are affecting people 120 feet away. They're projecting that, that contaminant that far away. Wow. But, but yeah, typically though, more outside air is better. But, but those high velocity air currents passing through open doorways or from the pedestal fan can project viruses hundreds of feet. And there you go, that's kind of it. Use, if you have a problem with that, I'm sorry, yeah. I was gonna say before we go, I wonder if you could talk about uh, local exhaust ventilation and the capture zone of local exhaust ventilation. Just a, you had a nice rule of thumb on that in the paper, I believe. Yeah, this is something that's in, in chapter six of the ventilation manual, but Basically, the, uh, the effect of a local exhaust hood, let's say it's a grinding hood, is one diameter away from that hood, we are getting, you're getting influence. But you can't, what's happening is suction degrades, it's called static pressure, but suction degrades in all directions, X, Y, and Z, and it sucks as good from behind the, the hood as it does from in front. So it's degrading in a, in a sphere of influence. That said, once you get one diameter away from the duct 
that it's in the in the hood that's that's being used, you will be at at one duct diameter. You're really beyond its its influence zone, so it's going to be more likely to be influenced by uh, room currents that are just normal room currents than you are by the local exhaust ventilation system. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, in the case of an of a paint spray booth, you got if you have a ten foot opening let's say 10 foot by 10 foot opening in a paint spray booth. Well, that's influencing within 10 feet. So you've got, you've got a bigger zone of influence. Um, but typical entry velocities into local exhaust ventilation systems are in the, we, we look for capture velocities of 100 to 200 feet per minute. So that is the velocity coming out of a, of a vector in an HVAC system is somewhere between 300 and 500 feet per minute. Mm. So, yeah, and if you can feel, here's another one. If you can feel air movement, then it is typically in excess of 100 feet per minute. So you have a, your own little hot wire anemometer or <laughs> velocity meter. If you have a warm hand and you can feel air across it, it's at probably about 100 feet per minute. Interesting, John. John, be, before we go, any any final thoughts, uh, final comments for our listeners? Well, I think it's, it gets all back into, I'll tie it back into the beginning. It's It really is all about that risk. You take risks every day. Um, if you're going to be intubating a patient, then you better have a control uh, system that includes a PPE, and that PPE better, better give you a a protection factor that is going to make make you come home and see your family at night. Where you're where you're going to be, where there is a possibility of infection, be considering everywhere you go. Consider in your mind how protected do I need to be? Do I even need to be there? Is it worth the risk? You know, we talked about elevators. You know, it might be the elevator might be the safer place. But when you get into a small room with a bunch of people and the HVAC system is not displacement, then you've got to think about where you're even going to sit in the room or whether you want a control device that, that might be an extra uh, device that might help for, to reduce the levels and reduce the risk. It's all about risk reduction. John, thank you so much. Cliff, any final questions or thoughts on your side? Oh, I, I do. Uh, I want to just get off COVID for a second and uh, just have a, a, a question for you. Uh, I never really thought about this, but several weeks back, one of our guests uh, made a comment that I've been thinking about ever since. And what the comment was, was that uh, properly ducted uh, bathroom fans and ceiling uh, and kitchen exhaust fans are typically the only fresh air that's supplied in many homes, that that's it. Those are the really only sources. And we leave them off a lot of times. Yeah, so yeah. I was wondering if you would suggest, you know, based on what you said, that we do leave them on all the time, because I've gotten to where we're doing that in my home now, and uh, just wanted your comment on it, because uh, we have a lot of listeners. And Cliff, that's a delicious question. You know, the, uh, the, the, test that they did uh, going back and looking at the, the Chinese restaurant uh, where they really did all that, that work and, and got all the data showed that when they went back to the HVAC system that was projecting the, the COVID virus to the, and the number of people that got ill, that the, that the, the HVAC system had no, it was a hundred percent recirculation, no outside air. So what you're saying is I think that it, in the, for years and years, engineers are all about reducing that uh, amount of outside air because that's where the cost is. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the formula is, you know, for BTUs is CFM times the delta T. Well, when if you're going outside air, or whether it's summertime and it's hot air, or wintertime and it's cold air, that's where the expense is. So in this, in the economic downturn and the economy, We've been shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, you also, run your fireplace. You know, if it's if it's a natural draft fireplace, or uh, get get a unit. Uh, you, you there is no free lunch. 
Right. Uh, so I, 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 I really believe that you're absolutely right. Here, the, the thing to know about the, your kitchen exhaust, uh, if you go into any uh, plant or any uh, uh, McDonald's, immediately you know that the plant is under significant negative pressure because mm -hmm. the air is rushing in the doors. Uh, that's probably not a bad thing. Or open, just open a, a couple of windows. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. John, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, great work with the ventilation for industrial settings during the COVID-19 pandemic and the industrial ventilation book. I know that uh, you, you've put a lot of time and effort into that. And um, these volunteer efforts uh, oftentimes aren't rewarded enough. And I just want to say thanks to you. And, and thanks for joining us today. Oh, you're very kind. Uh, you know, we have, I'd like to thank the ACGIH board uh, and Frank Mortal and, and the education crew and Lisa Brousseau, who I know is, has probably been on here before. And she's, uh, she's been very helpful and come back and help the volunteer and you know, go to ACGIH. There's a whole series of webinars on there. If you really want to get in, delve into the, uh, the heart part of trying to figure out how, what is going to be the best way to dilute this p potential uh, uh, to to uh, an acceptable risk. And we want to thank ACGIH for their sponsorship as well. Um, if you get a chance, jump on their website, join the, join the group, and uh, look forward to talking to more folks from ACGIH as we go along. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Jonathan Hale. Also to my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Please come back and join us next Friday for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 